thanks uh, very much. I'm glad to see people have uh, an enjoyable time at lunch. Uh, um, this afternoon, we're going to be diving in to two of a handful of methods that on which we're going to spend uh, the most time during this boot camp because they serve as exemplars for bringing together, on the one hand, data science, and on the other, system science. All of them involve methods that uh, characterize dynamics over time and that are capable of informing our understanding of behavior over time using temporal data, time series. The method with which I'll be starting right now is distinguished further by the fact that it, it's associated with a particularly simple formulation that is easy to grasp but shares the broad features of much more sophisticated later methods, some of which we'll be, um, be examining later this afternoon. So I'm starting with a simple method to orient you and to give you a, a first glimpse of reasoning concerning an underlying system evolving over time where there's data arriving over time about that system that's partial, incomplete, in some cases uh, not even available, potentially, as we'll see for some hidden Markov models, and yet which clues us in to the underlying state of the system. So we'll have some system that's evolving over time in ways that we can't directly observe that it involves underlying states that we can't measure with certainty or, or um, directly, uh, directly determine, but where we'll have this data which hints individually as to what's going on in the underlying situation, but where each data point that we observe is terribly ambiguous, terribly uncertain, terribly partial in the information it provides. But by taking advantage of model theory here in the form of transition possibilities between states on the one hand and characteristics of multiple data items, the context of the data, the fact that we have not just data points alone in solitudes, but data points that are neighboring that um, may also help us interpret what's going on at this period of time we can start to reliably infer what's going on in the underlying system right now, what its underlying state is. And this basic intuition, having partial or incomplete data observed over time, cluing us into the underlying state of a system that we can't directly observe but is evolving uh, as, as time goes on, will carry us over to much more sophisticated methods like PM, CMC, and part of the So we're going to start with this technique of, of hidden Markov models. Even though it's somewhat arguably as to whether it's a system science technique, I think it can reasonably be classified as such. Um, uh, but it will give us a, a pointer for much more sophisticated uh, approaches. So the idea here is we have a common circumstance. Um, we see this all the time in, in our data needs. We have an underlying system. It's transitioning among a, a set of states, which we can reasonably describe categorically, perhaps in a nominal fashion. So maybe those states are whether I am walking, whether I am sitting, whether I am engaged in a standing posture, 
or whether I'm lying down. Alternatively, maybe it's a matter, am I in this room or not over time? And I have a GPS signal that's noisy and, and sometimes gives measurements closer to my true position, sometimes uh, further. Maybe it's a matter of my inside or outside. In any one time, we could characterize me as being inside or outside, but that changes over time. My way to Marcus Hall is inside, and then I went to outside, and then I went to inside. So my underlying situation is changing, but it's changing amongst, in a categorical way, a way that involves the specific state possibilities. Okay? Um, and often we have some theory what the states are and the possible transitions between them. Um, we're going to have one or more types of empirical observations over time, one or more types. And we'll have a time series, perhaps regular, perhaps irregular, of time-specific observations. Okay? Um, the observations are individually ambiguous, noisy, sparse, often insufficient to, identify, to conclusively identify the state by themselves. Um, and typically, uh, there's going to be a distribution of possibilities for different states. For example, if I'm standing here, maybe measuring my accelerometry levels, we'd see a modest level of, of accelerometry associated with my swaying and so on. If I were sitting, I might see a somewhat different level as I swivel in my chair or across my legs. Uh, and there might be an overlap. If you look at the accelerometry, my sort of acceleration levels over time, there might be an overlap between these distributions. So a given measurement might be ambiguous, but even the curves might have large amounts of overlap, meaning this could be a large number of measurements which could reasonably be construed as either sitting or standing. By contrast, if I'm walking, I'll probably have a different profile, one with higher levels of acceleration associated with it, which might make it quite likely I'm, I'm standing. Either that or I'm swiveling quickly in my chair to catch a phone or whatever. Um, and the goal here is we'd like to infer with confidence what's going on. In other words, what state are we located in at one time? Am I sitting now? Am I standing? And how does that change over time? Maybe our goal is to understand how much time people are spending sitting. There's actually quite a big, big body of research uh, within the past decade on the health effects of sitting compared to standing, compared to um, you know, a walking desk. And maybe we're interested in studying that from smartphones. But at the end of the day, the smartphone collected data is going to be useful, but we'd like to use sensors to infer with low burden to the participant how much sitting people are doing. And we can start with accelerometry, but we've got to boil it down into an understanding of the underlying state. Or we want to look at accelerometry data, take into account that people may be in a vehicle or not. So we want to label, are people in a vehicle now? If so, we'll put aside their accelerometry readings. We won't attribute them to enormous physical activity and vigorous, vigorous amounts of moderate to vigorous physical activity if, in fact, they were just in a car or a truck on a gravel road. Um, so you know, that's another case of, of needing to classify over time. Are they in a vehicle or not? OK. So here we have this underlying system transitioning between categorical states according to some theory. We have observations that are individually ambiguous, noisy, uncertain about that underlying state. And we're trying to infer what, 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 in what state we are at any one time and in a whole sequence of these. Um, so research questions that can be addressed by this sort of method are placed here. And they include what categorical state am I in at the current time or at time t, looking back retrospectively or taking into account all the data? What is the most likely sequence of states that I've gone through? If you look at my data for the course of the study, you know, a 90-day study, what was the like, most likely sequence of states that I was in over time? Um, the single most likely sequence. 
what's the balance of time spent in different states? Maybe it's a uh, hidden markup model as to whether I'm, I'm you know, using, uh, have the screen state on or off. We have one of those. And how much time am I spending on getting screen time on my phone? What are transitions between the states and how often do they occur? And indeed, what are the categorical states that underlie this system? So the idea here is something like this. And, it, and for simplicity and kind of ease of, of depiction, I've indicated two possible states. One is an on-person state. The phone is on my person. And I'm, maybe I'm interested in, in recognizing periods of time using Ethica data where I'm carrying the phone, and therefore that data is representative of me, versus where I'm not carrying the phone. It's off my person. You know, my phone is sitting on a, on a seat somewhere, right? Um, and during the time where it's off person, if the phone detects a nearby person, that doesn't necessarily mean I'm nearby that person. If I'm away from the phone and it's sitting there, I shouldn't classify that period of time where I'm away from it, say for eight hours while I sleep, as that I'm sedentary. Because we actually don't have measurements on me. We just have measurements of a phone that's off person. It's not with me. Similarly, if, if the phone is sitting there and uh, I have zero screen time on the phone, we shouldn't take that as an indication that I'm getting zero screen time at all. We just don't know what I am doing other than, than engaged with the phone. So we might censor out the data which is off person and received from the phone even as to location, right? Because I might be at the gym uh, or I'm out for a run and left my phone at home. So here we have two states, on person, off person, as to whether I'm carrying the phone or not with me. Uh, and uh, I want, I'd like to know at any one time, say for a 30 second interval, is the phone on my person or off person? Hmm? Simple idea, right? Um, I want to know over time, at any one point, was, was I carrying the phone or not? Because maybe I want to censor the data from that time period if I was not carrying the phone. I want to say that's not representative of the participant themselves. It's just, you know, they, the phone wasn't being carried. Okay, now the idea here is that at any 30 second epoch, we have observations. Maybe some of those observations, for example, are acceleration profiles. So there's some level of acceleration. And we could figure out different ways of measuring this. Maybe it's the norm of the x, y, and z measurements on the accelerometer. So maybe it's the standard deviation or the MSSD, the, the mean um, uh, sort of level of variation in the, in the acceleration uh, norm. But we, we might have some measure of acceleration that has a distribution associated with it for the on-person state. And then there's a distribution implied for the off-person state. And you'll notice for the off-person state, the distribution is, has a lower uh, zero center compared to the on-person state. If it's on-person, um, there might be more movement expected than if it's just sitting on a handbag or chair or backpack or on a counter at home or what have you. So in short, for acceleration, there's a different distribution that applies for on-person com compared to what it is if I'm in an off-person state, right? And so from a given acceleration movement, uh, acceleration reading, I might then ask, okay, how likely is that to occur from an off-person state? How likely is it that that reading occurred from an on-person state? And use that to try to infer, right? But we're dealing here typically with more than one measurement type. So for example, we might have a gyroscope or orientation measure on the phone. Orientation is most appropriate, which tells us is the phone in a horizontal position or not. Okay, um, using gravity vectors, we could figure out is the phone essentially in a horizontal position or not. And the idea is, look, if it's off person, it's more likely to be horizontal than not horizontal, because we put our phones down on a lot of flat surfaces whether it's a bedside table, a counter at home, a seat, or what have you. It's not always that way. Maybe it's in my backpack or in my handbag or what have you. But it's more likely it's 
it's horizontal, perhaps, and not horizontal. And well, we might have ground truth studies that, that allow us to incorporate that distribution. With, uh, with on-person data, I might expect, well, it's more likely to be not horizontal than horizontal. It's possible that I have it horizontal while it's on-person, but it's somewhat less likely. It's in my lap, maybe, for example, right? Um, but it's less likely than not horizontal. Or maybe I want to use information, is it plugged in? With the idea being, look, if I'm carrying my phone, if I have it on my person, sitting in my lap, in my pocket, um, uh, what have you, um, if it's physically on me, I'm carrying it, the chance that it's plugged in is comparatively small. It's a probability distribution and, and it's probably a mass function. And that probability will be comparatively low compared to no. Occasionally I've been known to plug my phone in while it's in my pocket. But it tends to get hot and be kind of unpleasant. Um, by contrast, if it's off-person, it's more likely to be plugged in. So maybe, you know, some fraction, 40% of the time, it's plugged in. So the idea here is that, look, let's, let's take it as a given for now that we have, some, we have some distributions associated with different particular criteria or types of observations. So when it comes to acceleration, we know what the distributions are like for on person and what they're like for off person. Similarly, for whether it's horizontal or not, we know what this probability mass function is for on person, for off person. Same thing for, for um, uh, whether it's plugged in or not. And the idea is we want to try to figure out, plumb the system to try to figure out at any one time, is the phone off person or on person? And do so for different periods of time. So we know. How much time, what times did they have it on person? So we would only consider data, say, for a subsequent analysis associated with their physical activity levels from when they had it on person. So this is the idea. And we're considering for each epoch, each period of time, whether um, uh, what the uh, readings are from the um, acceleration profile, the pose, and uh, whether or not it's plugged in. Here's another example of a hidden Markov model. Maybe we have an outbreak and a non-outbreak state. For no particular deep reasons, these are both dichotomous classifications. Maybe in a non-outbreak state, oh man, this is uh, using bad terminology. Um, uh, Charles has, has clued me into the error of my ways. Um, this should say not clinically presenting and clinically presenting, not subclinical, okay? And this is not clinically presenting, clinically presenting. The idea is suppose in a non-outbreak state, we have some distribution associated with the number of clinical cases that will be seen. And that tends to be lower than it is over here in an outbreak state, where we might have more cases for a foodborne illness. Let's take foodborne illness here. Um, alternatively, for non-clinically presenting cases, if we allowed people to report, say, with a system like Ethica, whether or not they are feeling ill today, we, we might have more people um, reporting uh, illness on a given day, even in a non-outbreak state. But in an outbreak state, we'll tend to have more. Okay? So there'll be the sentinels carrying Ethica who can report when they're feeling ill, even if it doesn't bring them to a clinician. And these are different distributions associated with each of those states. And we want to figure out in a given epoch, say of one week or one day, we want to figure out how many, is there an outbreak in place there? Was there a foodborne illness outbreak that was operating? Um, and there might be overlap between these, uh, between these situations uh, in terms of the distributions. Any one measurement will be ambiguous. The distributions themselves will be overlapped. <coughs> But if we get enough measurements, the idea is we might be able to tease this out. But we have to account for the fact that over time, the state may, the underlying state may change. Okay, um, so the current state is changing over time amongst a set of discrete categorical possibilities. The states are treated as mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. So the state on person, off person, completely characterize the possibilities is how it's treated. Um, uh, contaminated versus, you know, restaurant contaminated or non-contaminated, or 
the person, the, the phone is off person or the person, it's on person and the person sitting or and it's on person and the person standing or on person and the person's lying down or on person and the person's engaged in active behavior that's uh, not one of those possibilities. So something other than remaining still. Okay, so these are discrete states. Are people comfortable with this notion of dividing up the possibilities for a given question into a set of categorical, categorical classes and uh, where those, the situation over time that a person's in will evolve between different classes as they go through, say, the day and time passes. Does that make sense to people? And you understand how you might have data from one or more types of sensor measurements or other types of measurements that might clue you in as to what state they're in where each data point is quite ambiguous. But we'd like to infer what the true situation is and how it evolves. And we have a time series where we might accumulate more and more evidence what state they're in, but their state might change. So I have more and more measurements that clue me in that an outbreak is going on, but maybe it switched meanwhile to a non-outbreak state in the meantime. And so I have to infer quickly enough for it to be meaningful. Okay, so here we have discrete states. We also are gonna have discrete time. We're gonna call them time steps or epochs or time slots. And for each time step, regardless of how we, we term it, um, there'll be exactly one observation of each type. Uh, for simplicity, we'll treat it here. So the idea is that um, we'll have an observation, say, as to my accelerometry, my mean accelerometry level for 30 second interval, um, whether or not the phone is plugged in for that 37, or for that 30 minute interval, and whether it's horizontal or not for that uh, 30 second interval. So there'll be one observation for each epoch, and if no observations are present for a given measurement, we might just classify it in a no observation category. There was no observation of GPS readings during this interval for me to use. And a likelihood function will take that into account. Um, uh, and um, if you are dealing with a choice of how long to make your time step, um, sometimes it behooves us to make it smaller so there's likely to be one measurement per interval, um, and we can often, you know, uh, often we're guided how broad we want to make the interval during, for our classification, depending how finely we want to divide time up, and how quickly they change, change state, the underlying system. And the idea here is that at a discrete time, we treat the system in exactly one state. Transitions between states occur over time, but for any one time step, I'm either, say for a 37 inter a 30 second interval, will treat me as sitting, standing, lying down, having the phone off person, being in an active state, one of those states, okay? And you could see immediately why it wouldn't be appropriate to consider, say, a time slot of a day, because it's not well defined. Am I lying down during that day, sitting during that day, you know, active during that day? Well, I'm, I'm different things um, at different times during that. Um, maybe we want to consider one minute intervals, so or we want to consider a 15 minute interval is a bit long, right? Because I might be engaged in different types of activities. So 30 seconds, that might be about, about uh, right, um, given that I'm unlikely to be sitting down and standing up and engaged in various types of activity all in the course of 30 seconds. Um, if your needs are finer, you could, you could focus it on, um, you know, five second intervals or what have you. Sorry, in the last part when you were saying exactly one, one observation for each time, mm. so can I ask what, what the time, the type of one? The oh, of one, one uh, of each type of observation. So, oh. for example, here, if I have three types of observation, acceleration, I have w the phone pose, whether it's horizontal or not, and I have whether or not it's plugged in. So for each type of these three types of observations, I'll have one observation, at zero or one observations for each interval. You, I mean, this is not a big deal. Like if you have more than one observation, 
you can often you take their mean or you, you take their median value, um, you know, depending on whether it's a continuous observation or not. Uh, so it's not it's not a big deal. Um, and by contrast, it is a big deal that we have discrete states, you know, states that are divided into a small set of categories or a set of categories. That's that's pretty well baked into the method. They've got to be you know, a, a certain count of states. It's not continuous states. Continuous states will take us to part of the whole term. This is, is the domain of discrete counts, discrete set of states, okay? Um, typically categorical in nature. With the observations, if you have zero observations, we often just create a no observation state. Um, so we have no GPS right now, or we have no you know, observation for whether the screen state is turning on or off. So by implication, it, it um, you know, it, it may have not turned on or off at that time or we're not recording at all. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, just, so I welcome these questions. So discrete states, discrete set of possibilities that we could be in at any one time, collectively exclusive, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive, and then discrete time over which we consider what state am I in. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? That foundational assumption. Okay. So let's let's go on and um, talk about another assumption. This one is a stronger assumption. It actually flies in the face of some of what we achieve with more sophisticated system science techniques like agent-based modeling. The assumption here is that the states are memoryless. So the idea is, look, it doesn't matter how long I've been in the state. I have the same transition probability of leaving the state. So no matter how long I've been sitting, the idea is I have the same chance per 30 second interval, if that's my epoch, of getting up. So I'm going to have a set of these intervals, and my transition at any one interval will be in exactly one state. So maybe at this interval I'm at that state, I, I stay in it for another state, I stay in it for another state, and then I transition at the time of the fourth state to this, and I stay in that for a given uh, epoch, maybe two epochs, and then I transition back. The idea here is that my probability of transitioning to another state is, it'll vary from state to state, but it is memoryless. It doesn't depend how long I've been in this state. I have the same chance of transitioning out no matter how long I've been there. Now, this is, um, this is actually not a assumption which is um, highly baked into the method. It is for basic hidden Markov models. There's a variant of this called semi-hidden Markov models, or semi-Markov models, which relax some of these assumptions. Memoryless state seems like a strong assumption. It turns out the method is pretty robust bec uh, when this is violated. And there's two reasons why. One reason is, if it's, not, if it's patently not the case, you can always break states up into multiple states. So you have a state that's like, you know, Instead of having, uh, let's say, these states are sitting, st are standing, sitting. Um, if you're concerned that, you know, people after they sit down often stand up again, then you have like, uh, instead of standing and sitting, uh, you have, you know, just sat down as one state, and then a state where you've been sitting for a while. And the idea is that if you're much more likely to jump up after you sat down for a short time, then you have a state that represents recently sat down, and after a while you transition to a sitting for a long time. And so it's, you kind of break the state up into to multiple states. So alternatively, um, uh, you can, you can uh, consider a situation where we have a we have a, a uh, given fixed probability of transitioning out of this, but hidden Markov models, even though it is known that empirically this, is, this memoryless assumption is, is not 
observed in a lot of cases, it turns out hidden Markov models are often quite effective despite that. And uh, uh, some of our testing with hidden Markov models have shown uh, a, a good degree of robustness despite violation of this in practice. But in a hidden Markov model context, in the most simple form of hidden Markov model, your probability of transitioning out of a given state has to be independent of how long you've been in the state. If you want to capture dependence, split the states. Okay. Um, so, uh, just an assumption here. Do, do people have an understanding of what I mean when I say it's memoryless? It doesn't matter how long you've been driving. So the idea is if your states are, are you in a vehicle or not, the idea would be, you know, if you're in a vehicle, your chance of transitioning to a state of no longer being in a vehicle is independent of how long you've been in that vehicle. So maybe it's you know, 0.1 per minute. Maybe you have an average time in the vehicle 10 minutes, and you have a 10% chance per minute, therefore, of leaving the vehicle. And some trips may last longer, some shorter, but uh, no matter how long it lasts, the idea is, you know, you have this same chance of, of, of leaving. Um, as I say, our own experience is that, that it's not too, the, the performance is not too much impeded by violations of that. Okay. Um, another assumption is um, that while we're in a state, we have a certain probability of observing a, um, uh, a certain um, measurement. And I said, for example, for acceleration, when we're in an on-person state, we have a certain distribution of acceleration values. When we're in off-person state, we have a certain distribution of values. These distributions are conditional on being in that state. So if you're in an off-person state, this distribution applies. If you're in this and the on-person state, that distribution applies. So by definition, these distributions that apply for acceleration are conditional on the state that you're in, right? But there's a further assumption that they are conditionally independent of each other based on being in that state. So if I'm in an off-person state, the idea is that my successive accelerometry readings will be, un or be independent statistically. They won't depend on whether. So while I'm in that state, the idea is you know, that if you look at my successive, if I'm sitting, and I'm considering a 30 second interval. The idea is that the, my accelerometry that's measured for one 30 second interval will be independent of that for the next 30 second interval. Conditional me still being sitting, it's going to be independent. So the idea is that me being off person, like the phone being off, oh, sorry, I should be not mixing metaphors. If I'm dealing with a sitting standing, uh, it would depend only on my, my posture. So the idea is my posture summarizes all that's needed to know in terms of dependence of the, uh, of the measurements. So um, within a given state, the measurements will be independent. Yes, Lavi. Um, sorry, I just heard you recall that we can view this whole the, the uh -huh. change of state model yes. in terms of the basic network. It's like yes. you can represent this as a state Correct. That is the machine state model we Correct. Kind of, or like the base. Yeah, so HMMs can be expressed as base maps. Yeah. So that eight, so you can implement it's it's it is what I'm describing here. That's just an implementation technique that uses more general base nets infrastructure. And it's the same thing. And the, the idea of conditional independence yeah. that they like, yeah, network is correct. Yeah, that's okay. right. The same thing thing applies in the base base net because it, it is HMMs. It's just uh, implemented with base nets. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so this is the the idea is that the observations are independent of each other as long as I'm in the same state. Um, and um, uh, so for a continuous observation. For example, we have a probability distribution conditional on the state. So for my acceleration, I have a probability distribution that applies conditional on being in that state that's different from what might apply being in another state. So if I'm off per if the phone is off person, there's one distribution of acceleration that applies 
versus if it's on person. Um, if it's off person, you might think there's no acceleration. Not necessarily, right? Maybe you're in a bus that's accelerating and decelerating. And the phone is off person. It's sitting in your backpack. But there's some measure of acceleration that's experienced. And so it's going to be some distribution, including non-zero values, for on person and off person. It will tend to be larger for on person. Yeah? Yeah, so I understand the memoryless property. Yeah. But um, for example, the screening turning on, I think it does depend on the previous time, like on how long I've been in that state. So, so suppose I haven't used my phone for two hours, yep. it's more likely that I use it. Yeah, so yep. if you want to capture that in a hidden Markov model, the way to do it is to, again, disaggregate the states. You split the states. And I would, I would note that the same need applies in system dynamics modeling if you have, like, if you want to say a person's chance of developing um, chronic kidney disease rises with the amount of time that they have spent, um, uh, that they have had diabetes. Um, or to use an example Cheryl mentioned to me in 2007, the amount of time that someone has had TB untreated might affect the severity of the TB and the probability of developing um, um, cavitary TB, a very severe form of TB. Um, so if you want to capture a phenomenon like that in a hidden Markov model, where how long you've been in that will materially affect your chance of transitioning in some way, or for that matter in a system dynamics model, what you do in the same, is the same. You split the state. So in system dynamics, you split the stocks, you have a you know, recent infection, or recently uh, activated, and then a, a longer period, or you know, infectious and non-infectious, symptomatic and non-symptomatic, or what have you. Um, and in a hidden Markov model, you would split a state like just put down phone, and then like phone has been, has been down for more than uh, an hour. And, and maybe there'd be different chances of you picking up the phone uh, and using it if it's just been down for a minute, and I want to glance at, you know, who just sent me the mail, where if it's been down for an hour, the chance is pretty high that I'm sleeping or something, and I'm not going to pick it up soon. And so you can do that by splitting the states. Mm -hmm. And it tends to be pretty effective. But I, I, I will just note here that these are the assumptions of HMMs. And like with memory, many statistical and machine learning approaches, these are the on-the-face-of-it assumptions that doesn't say you can't use it outside of these, it's just you really have to test its effectiveness. In my experience, hidden Markov models do quite well when these assumptions are violated. It's just that they are optimized for situations where the assumptions are maintained. Okay? Yes, Levy? Sorry, so like the, like, like the arrow, mm. so in, in their state model, yeah. Here. Yeah. so in the example you were talking, sitting or standing on the full armor up, are Time will be the only things that go that would make you go from one state Correct. to the other. Correct. So, so over the passage of time, say per per minute interval, I have a five percent chance. Is the idea according to this model? On a, I have a five percent chance per minute of putting that on the phone. And if it's if it's off person, I have a five per, or I have a twenty percent chance per minute. Uh, chance of picking up. And what that means is if you do the math, it's, it's the reciprocal of that, right? So every 20 minutes on average, I, I keep the phone on person on average for 20 minutes, that's 1 over 0.05. And I would tend to have the phone off person for on average 5 minutes at a time, on average. Um, but yeah. Yeah, so my question is, is it valid for that one arrow to have two so for example, not only looking at like 0 0.05 per minute, but say it's also like others, you know, like other conditions that like if someone called me or, you know, couldn't Good question. Or, or does that arrow only can carry one, you know, one It can only carry, it, it can only be a fixed constant, um, which applies independent how long you've been in here. So, so like in an agent-based model, we would have like a message transition. It's like if someone called me, I'd pick it up. Yeah. But but there's um, there's n there's not a way built into Markov models to do it. Now, 
If you ask, could you do that? I would say, okay, you want to do that, Lavi? You want, you want to do that? I'll talk with you about how to do that. Um, and I have ways to do this. Um, but we want to talk. Like, like if your Ethica data had um, data, for example, on incoming calls, mm -hmm. you could actually have a way in which, and, and I'd be glad to describe it separately. I don't want to go too far down this road. But I could have a model which captures the fact, essentially, that you can transition either directly to off or to say on person, pick up the phone directly for reason independent of a phone call, or when a phone call comes in, you you then switch over to this state. There are ways of accomplishing that. Um, it's it's uh, slightly more uh, subtle, and uh, I can describe it later if you were interested. But I want to get to the basics of the approach here, because it's quite insightful. And once again, from my experience, when these assumptions are violated, it tends to work pretty darn well. Okay? We've used it for a lot of cases, but, um, but you want to be cautious, and you want to know what these assumptions are. Um, other questions about this? Okay, I have some mathematics here which I'm going to be providing to you, and I'll walk you through a bit, but I don't want to dwell on it hugely because I don't want people's eyes to glaze over who aren't uh, very comfortable with it. So the idea here is we have a set of possible states. We have a set of possible observations, um, or a set of observations, observation types, okay? Um, uh, actually, this is a set of observations. So. If you have two observation types, maybe I observe, um, you know, accelerometer reading, a pose reading, and a uh, a reading as to whether or not it's plugged in. That will be one observation. It's an observation vector, but it's one possible observation um, would be a certain reading for accelerometry, a certain reading for the pose of the phone, like it's horizontal, and a certain reading. For whether it's that it's plug, that it is plugged in. Another one would be, you know, 0 0.03 for accelerometer. Uh, it's not horizontal and it's not plugged in. Those would be possible observations. That's X. So we have a set of possible observations. And then we're going to have a transition matrix. And what this is going to say is, for each state that you're in, what's your probability per unit time per or per time step, I should say, of transitioning to another state. Okay, so the idea is this is a matrix, um, and each row is going to be associated with the state you're currently in, and each value along that row is going to say your probability of transitioning to state one, or probability of transition to state two, probability of transition to state three. One of those states will be your the same state you're in, which is the probability you'll stay there, and these uh, the row has to add up to one, and uh, this could be a total count of observations over time. Uh, and then there's some initial probability of being in each state, okay? Um, okay, and then we're going to have observation probabilities, or, or um, these are going to be um, the probability, given that I'm in a certain state, that I will observe a given observation. This is a likelihood. Um, so I'm in a certain state. You know, I'm in the, I'm in the, the off, the phone is in an off, per, if the phone is in an off-person state, what is the probability that a certain level of accelerometry will be observed, of accelerometer reading, and the pose of the phone, and uh, thirdly, that it would be plugged in. And so if we have an observation, we'll write x sub i to indicate the observation that occurred at that time i, where i runs from 1 to t. Hmm? Um, and uh, here, um, we'll ask, OK, um, What's the probability that uh, if we're in a given state S, what's the probability we'll observe observation X, okay? So what's the probability that I would have observed, you know, this level of accelerometry readings and gyroscope readings if I were standing? Um, what would be that probability if I were sitting? Um, and what would be the probability if I were, excuse me, lying down? Um, we specify this in two ways. The classical one way is if you have discrete outcomes, we specify what's called an emission matrix, which is the probability in that state I will 
observe this or that or that, a set of discrete possibilities. Alternatively, for a lot of cases, we have continuous measurements like accelerometry. It's not just possibilities like plugged in or not, or horizontal or not. We have a continuous measurement. Or we have a number of cases of illness that have, have been, uh, uh, that, where people have gone to their doctor um, and reported possible foodborne illness. And so this would be a, a situation where we have a distribution um, that characterizes the probability of observing a certain observe, observation given that we're in a certain state, like the outbreak state. What's the probability we will have no people reporting illness on this day versus one person versus two persons? If we're in an outbreak state, what's the probability? The probability we'll observe 10, 10 persons sick. This should be viewed as a likelihood function. The likelihood we would observe this observation given that we're in a certain state. Okay? Um, so, so let's consider another example here. Um, imagine a situation I want to classify whether someone is currently smoking, vaping, or not using any product on the basis of their wearable data and wearable from a phone, and data from a phone. None other than the inimitable Chin Yang will be talking to us about this problem later with a Markov model. Um, for a student population, uh, or a population on campus, I should say, um, who, uh, who, for whom we, we uh, had measurements from smartphones. But in general, we could think about using wearables and, and smartphones to probe this. And the idea here is we have three possible states. They're not using anything. They're smoking or they're vaping. And the idea is that it's collectively exhaustive and mutually exclusive. Um, we're in one state at any one time in exactly one state. And here's our transition probability matrix. The idea is, look, let's suppose we have one minute time steps. If we're currently not using the idea is with 99% probability, the next time step will also be non-using. There's a 1% chance, perhaps, that we transition. And if we transition to a smoking state, it'll be with probability 0 0.003, and, and with vaping, probability 0 0.007 um, in that next time step. And the idea is, look, if we're in a smoking state, then we have a 0.98 uh, probability of, of transitioning to a non-use state, that's this arrow, right? Um, or we have a 0.03 probability from a smoking state. Oh, that's, that's uh, excuse me. Well, from a smoking state, we have an 80% probability of, trans of, of transitioning back to itself. And from a smoking state, we have a 2% chance uh, per time unit of transitioning to a vaping state here, okay? So if I'm smoking um, now, in this time step, in this minute, in the next minute, the idea is we have an 18% chance of transitioning to no use, a 2% chance of transitioning to vaping, firing up that e-cigarette, and the balance, which is 80% of just staying in a smoking state. And what this will mean is that if you do the math, on average, I'm going to be smoking if I'm in a smoking state, uh, on average, I'm going to be spending about five minutes smoking. Mm -hmm. Where did I get that five from? Well, my probability of leaving the smoking state at any one time is 20%. It's one minus 0.8. And if we, so that's 0.2. And if we divide one by 0.2, we get five minutes on average. And I'm taking into account the fact that it's memoryless and it's geometrically distributed and therefore it's and the mean of a geometric distribution is one over the, the, the transition constant term. Um, so you see the structure of this matrix. A row is the current state I'm in, and the column is my successive probabilities of going to the different states, including the same state I'm in. So if I'm in a vaping state, I have a 98% probability of staying in the vaping state. So let me ask this. Compared to smoking and vaping, which will last longer on average here? In this, if, if this if this were a hidden Markov model assumption of how we transition in the underlying system, 
Would I spend more time vaping on average or more time smoking on average? Um, like once I've started, what's the, the mean time of smoking versus vaping? Which is longer? Vaping. Vaping is longer. Because here I have only a 2% chance of stopping vaping in a given minute. Whereas I have a 20% chance of stopping smoking in a given minute. So on average, I spend one over 0.2 or five minutes smoking, whereas I spend one over 0.02 or 50 minutes vaping on average. So this is the idea. Now, I want you to recognize something. Because we're going to be talking about hidden Markov models. Excuse me. We're going to be talking about particle filtering models soon enough. And what you're seeing here is a definition of the underlying system. This is a particularly simple underlying system. For our particle filtering, we're going to be talking about systems which are um, series of differential equations, system dynamics models, or um, in, in principle, they could be agent-based models or hybrid models. Um, we've done things of that sort. Uh, here, this is a dynamic model. This is a, and it's arguable whether it's dynamic. I'll say it, it can be reasonably viewed as a dynamic model at any one time or in a certain state, and we have a certain probability transition to another state. This is what's called a Markov model. And Markov models of this sort are actually quite common in the health sciences and health technology evaluation, HTA, et cetera. Um, so it's nothing to, to, to be snooty about, but just recognize this is kind of your, your um, magmatic or your, your sort of simplest model that can aspire to be dynamic. Dynamic because it's characterizing the change in the system over time. And you could argue, well, it's static because I have the same probability of leaving at every time step independent of how long I've been there. But, you know, it, it, is, it can be viewed as a kind of simple dynamic model of sorts. Okay, very simple dynamic model. So this is our underlying model of how things, this is our theory of how things change in the underlying system. This is our theory, and then we're going to encounter that theory with evidence that comes in the form of these observations, these likelihood functions, and observations from the world. And that's going to clue us in. So this is our theory about how the underlying system evolves, and we're going to have evidence incoming at different times that's going to clue us in, we're probably smoking, or we're probably engaged in no use right now or we're probably vaping. Mm -hmm. And we're going to try to infer what's going on. This is our characterization of the underlying dynamics of the system. And the clues are going to come in the form of observations. And we're going to use these likelihood functions to, to use those clues as they come in to clue us into what's going on. Recognizing any one clue will be ambiguous. Am I smoking? Am I vaping right now? But the more clues we get, the closer we'll be able to say, aha, probably we're vaping. But we gotta deal with the fact that over time that may change. Maybe I'll start smoking. <laughs> and by the time I'm pretty confident we're vaping, cat's out of the bag and they're smoking. You know, uh, so we gotta be we gotta be cognizant there's an underlying system which is changing here. Um, and we're gonna be dealing with that in our particle filtering as well. Um, okay. So the general way in which we use these models is to train them, um, to train the model, and that can be done in various ways, supervised, unsupervised learning. And if you have uh, supervised learning, you can validate the model against um, a subset of the data. You might then test it out of sample with a different set of data altogether, like you ended yesterday. And then you can apply the hidden Markov model. After you've felt confidence in it, you can apply it to a time series of data. Okay? So let's, let's consider a little example. Suppose we want to know, is there an outbreak in progress of foodborne illness at this time? Okay? Uh, time 15. We have one week epochs. Um, and the idea is, look, um, there'll be some periods here where, which have outbreaks and some periods not. Um, and uh, at a given measurement here will be ambiguous. It could be just a bad week without an outbreak. 
um, or it could be a situation suggesting an incipient outbreak. Um, uh, so the idea here is, look, there are outbreaks, and there are periods with outbreaks and without outbreak. We consider a week at a time, and we know that periods with outbreaks tend to have higher incident case counts or reported illness than those without an outbreak. And here we're going to want to try to determine if this week was there an outbreak in place, and this week was there an outbreak. And notice how I'm phrasing that in kind of a fuzzy way. For some of the methods we'll use with HMMs, what we're going to actually say is, what's the probability for a given week that there's an outbreak going on? What's the probability for this week there's an outbreak? In other cases, we're going to try to find the single most likely sequence that probably the single most likely sequence is no outbreak, no outbreak, no outbreak, 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 no outbreak, etc. Okay? This is, this is the challenge that confronts us with hidden mark upon us. So here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, suppose that we have two states, non-outbreak and outbreak. State two is non-outbreak, state one is an outbreak. And the idea here is that in a non-outbreak state, we'll have some distribution for the number of incident cases of possible foodborne illness that are reported. And that that distribution will have a lower mean and peak value. So maybe around 15, 14, something like this. So the idea is in a non outbreak state, we, do, we expect fewer cases to be reported to public health that could be foodborne illness cases. But suppose for outbreaks, well, in an outbreak state, we'd expect there'd be more cases, maybe on average about 25, okay? Um, uh, and what, what you'll notice here is there's an overlap here, right? If we consider the overlap of this and this, let's suppose we have, um, let's say, 20 cases reported. Could that be an outbreak state? Yeah, it could be an outbreak state. It'd be kind of a, an outbreak state. If there are 20 cases reported in this week, it would be, you know, not a, terrifically devastating outbreak, but it will be a, an outbreak city. There's a significant possibility that we'll only have 20 cases. Could it be a non-outbreak? Yeah, there's some possibility. It's just a bad week for non-outbreaks, right? Um, so the likelihood of observing 20 in a non-outbreak state is not huge, but it's, it's, it's also not enough. It, it could be a, a non-outbreak that's just an unlucky week. And we're trying to tease out which state are we in at any one time, okay? So we want to know if this week, that week with 15 cases, are we in an outbreak state or not? So let's, let's consider this, okay? Here we go. So these illustrations, by the way, of the adapted, in some cases, uh, modified some things a little bit from, uh, from zucchini, okay? Um, uh, a great book on hidden Markov and models and time series. So here are our two distributions, and you notice the overlap, right? Um, if we have 20 cases, it's a bit ambiguous. But the more cases we have, it will start to clue us in what state we might be at. But meanwhile, we're having an underlying system whose evolution we posit to be a proceeding according to this theory. So in other words, from an outbreak state to a non-outbreak state, we have a 0.9, a 90% chance per week we'll, record, we'll return back to a non-outbreak state. For a non-outbreak state, maybe we have a 30% chance of going to an outbreak state. Suppose that's our theory of the underlying dynamics. We could characterize that in a matrix similar to this one, but I'm not going to do it here. Okay, so suppose we posit that in st in, at the very early time, we're starting at the initial time, state one, the state of an outbreak with 75% probability, and state two, the non-outbreak state with 25% probability. Um, it turns out the evidence tends to wash that out later, so these initial probabilities are often not nearly as important as you might fear, but uh, we need to make some initial probability assumptions. So suppose now we start to see observations week after week coming in. So here we are, week one. We have an observation of 31 cases, incident cases reported. 31 cases. And what we're going to consider is what's the probability 
if we observe 31 cases, that that would occur in a non-outbreak state versus an outbreak state, okay? Um, and uh, here, I have to be, uh, be careful. I think these, these labels are, are mixed. But in a non-outbreak state, the sh curve shifted to the left, the probability of observing 31 cases is vanishingly small. Um, in an outbreak state, 31 cases is quite possible. Um, and that will lend credence to the fact that we're probably in an, in an outbreak state. And successive measurements will be balancing, okay, what states they're in. This actually shows, this diagram shows what state it was truly in. So these states, this was in an outbreak state, this is a non-outbreak, non-outbreak, that's why the distribution is this way. So these are a set of observations, and this also shows what state it's in on, at, at each uh, given time here. So it was in an outbreak state, non-outbreak, 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 outbreak, and non-outbreak. That's the underlying situation which we can't directly observe. Um, and we want to try to infer what state it's in. So um, here, there's going to be uh, a set of key algorithms we're going to use. The main one, the workforce, which uh, the workhorse, which ends up being used for the Viterbi algorithm as well, is the forward-backward algorithm. And I'll be showing you how this works. But basically, it takes into account surrounding measurements as well as measurements right now. Okay. Um, so the idea is, look, um, maybe you have a measurement for this week, but if you have a measurement in a surrounding week. Um, that tells you something very different, you've got to be cognizant of that because it might hint as to what was going on in this week as well. Uh, so there's two ways of training a model like this. One is a supervised way. So here we have labeled data, true data, which we've labeled. Uh, and we have an HMM structure. And uh, we basically take this true data, which we've labeled, and we use it to derive the transition probabilities, and we use it to derive the characteristics of the probability distributions, okay? So we derive the probability distributions based on some ground truth data, and then we apply this abducted model, abduced model, to other data. So the idea is we have enough data that we build the model and form by that data, and then we apply it in other contexts. So, the data that you might have of this sort might be data where you know, based on specific studies, you know um, what was going on, and you use it to build the hidden Markov model. What's more common for hidden Markov models are what's called unsupervised learning. So here we have no labeled data. We have data that um, does, we don't know the underlying ground truth, and we infer the HMM structure to best explain the patterns in the data. And then, typically what we do is we take some of the data and we use it, so maybe we have an overall set of data like this, um, which has sets of observations, and we'll take some part of the data, maybe it's you know 75% of this uh, data, and or 50% of the data, and we'll use that to test. The, uh, so we'll train a model based on this data, and then we will, um, and, and and then we will end up going and cross-validating the data on a different uh, subset to to assess the degree to which that model still yields, um, still is is most consistent with what we see here. So we can actually, for example. Uh, use an unsupervised algorithm here, an unsupervised algorithm here, and see the degree to which they are, they are consistent. Um, so here we're training the algorithm to maximize the quantity. The most uh, frequent one is to maximize what's called maximum likelihood observation. So we're trying to find the HMM that makes this observed data the most likely to occur. And that involves training the values in the transition matrix and the values in the um, uh, in the emission matrix or the uh, probabilities associated with uh, uh, the conditional probabilities of observing data being in a state. So here we have this situation of outbreak, non-outbreak. 
we have these two distributions, um, and uh, these are incident cases we're observing. Here's our transition matrix here, and the transition matrix is given by these values. So here I have a, if I'm in an outbreak state, I have a 10% probability of staying in that state and a 90% probability of going to a non-outbreak state. By contrast, if I'm in a non-outbreak state, I have a 30% probability of remaining there and a 70% excuse me, a 30% probability of going to an outbreak state and a 70% probability for remaining in an outbreak state. Here are distributions associated with each. So this is the distribution, the likelihood distribution associated with if I'm in a non-outbreak state, what's the probability? I'll observe different number of cases and uh, similarly for an outbreak state. Okay, um, so here we go. And we will go through and uh, we'll be computing the likelihood. And the way that we do this with the forward-backward algorithm is illustrated here. So for a given model, we will assess uh, the, the likelihood of, 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 um, of, of obtaining the data, of seeing that data given the model. So we have some initial state distribution, 75% chance of being an outbreak state, 25% in the next state. And the question is, how likely, given this model, is it that we will observe this empirical data? What's the likelihood that we'll observe it? And we'll be trying to find a model that's more likely to observe this data. And so for a given model, we will successively compute the likelihood of having, ex having observed that data. And that involves considering a couple things. One thing it'll observe considering is, given the state that we posit we might be in at a given time, what's the likelihood we will observe that measurement? So here's our measurement 31 for, for time one. And if we're in state A at time one, what's our likelihood of observing 31 cases? And if we're in state B at time 31, what's our likelihood of observing that case? That's one thing we'll be taking into account. But there's something else we take into account. Can anyone tell me what it is? And it has to do with this whole mess before here. What is this? So this is the probability if we're in A, we'll observe, we'll observe um, the uh, observation, 31. Um, this is for state B. But what does this thing represent? Can anyone tell me? Mm. Yeah. For the first part is like your previous time was, the, uh, was exactly. state A, and for the second part exactly. your previous time was state B. Exactly. So what we're taking into account here is these are computing the different ways that we could be in, in state A, right? Um, we could be in state A here in two different ways, right? Um, one way we could be in state A is if we were in state A the previous time step, and we stayed there. That's this A to A. Alternatively, we could be in state A now if we were in state B in the previous time step and we transitioned from B to A. And so we need to consider what was the probability that we were in state A in the previous time step so that we could figure out this likelihood. And the probability that we're in state A in the previous time step was that was just the initial probability. So that's that 0.75. Probability we're in state B in the previous time step, that's at 0.25. So this, this uh, probability within this kind of parentheses here is just the probability that we have transitioned, we're in state A now. It's 0.75 times the probability we would have stayed in state A. 0.75 is the probability we were in state A in the previous time step. And this 0.25 is the probability we were in state B in the previous time step when we transitioned from B to A. So this, this thing in the, in the uh, parentheses is just the, the uh, probability that we're in state A now. Um, and this is the probability that we would observe that observation conditional on being in state A. Similarly, this is the probability we're in state B now. And how could that have come about? Well, 
the probability, there's some probability we're in state B in the previous time, set 0.25 times that we stayed there. And then there's a probability we're in state A in the previous time step times the probability of going from B to A. So this whole thing here is the probability that we are in state A and observed um, this, or uh, probability state B and we observed 31. This is the probability we're in state A that we observed 31, right? Um, and, and that makes up the, the um, the, this uh, likelihood calculation. Um, the first part is is going to be associated with uh, our probability of observing it uh, in state A, and the second part, probability of observing it in uh, in state B. Okay, so this is the probability uh, of being in each of these states and observing that data, and we'll then, as it turns out, normalize it, and um, that will give us the probability that we are in this state or this state given that we've seen that. And then we need to do this again in the next time step. But here we have to take into account not just this, that probability, but the probability we're in each of these states here. And so this whole value here ends up being plugged in here, and this whole value here ends up being plugged in here, but in the same basic reasoning way. And it turns out this can be written very neatly in a, um, in a symbolic way as the initial state distribution times in a matrix multiplication sense. So this is a vector times a uh, matrix. This is the likelihood matrix, or the, the transition matrix, times this, uh, this likelihood, the likelihood of observing uh, the observation one for being in each, uh, in each state. And successively, as we consider more and more, uh, and we consider the probabilities that were in each state um, for successive observations, we'll just chain these together. And so over time, we'll be considering the probability that we're in a given state based on what we have previously seen. Um, and we'll also consider the probability that we would have, if given if we posit that we're in that state now, what's the probability we will observe the given, um, a given measurement, uh, the given observation from the world? So this is how we end up performing the, the forward pass of the forward backward algorithm. It's calculating based on all the observations till now and the current observation, what's the likelihood I'm in state A or B? Does that make sense? What's the likelihood I'm in state A or state B Take into account not just this value, that would be these P of A and P of B for this. It's not just taking into account this value, it's taking into account, well, previous values were different things, and regardless of what I was in those previous states, I have some chance of changing. So maybe I'm quite certain what I was in the previous state because it had a huge value. Maybe it was 31, right? Maybe I was quite certain what I was in state uh, at time one. Based on that 31, I say, oh, come on, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, for sure I'm in state, state B, right? Um, uh, even though I thought I was quite little likely to start in state B at the start, from this 31, I'm quite certain the chance of, of measuring that in state A is vanishingly small. That's this, uh, this distribution right here, but the state of observe, the chance of observing is quite quite high for this distribution, probability distribution B. So maybe coming out of this, I'm quite certain I'm in state B, right? But when I take the 16, I, I know, okay, the previous state, I was almost certainly in state B, but, but with this 16, first of all, it's lower. It could be explained by either but I also have a chance of transitioning from one to the other. And, I need to and I'm going to take that into account in my transition matrix. So what this is doing is it's successively considering the underlying dynamics of the system, the fact that the system is changing under the surface in ways we can't directly observe. But we have these hints coming in the form of data. And we can't just take into account each hint in isolation. We have to consider the dynamics of the system. 
um, what we were in last time, but also well, how we might have changed from that. And that's exactly what's shown here. These probabilities, the 0.75 and the 0.25, those are the probabilities we were in different states in the past time, and these are the probabilities we would have changed, and, and, and that's what you see here. Um, these are the probabilities that we'd now be in state A or B, here A and state B, times the probability of observing conditional on being in, in A or B. Um, okay, so this is the probability vector. If we ran this, if we, if we wrote this out in its full and its full complement, we get something like this. Um, this is the initial probability, pi. Um, it's a vector of initial possibilities, a probability of starting in each successive state. And then p is the uh, probability of observing um, the first data point uh, for each, it's a vector. Um, uh, probability of observing, uh, excuse me, it's a, it's a matrix whose successive diagonal entries are the probability of observing x1 given you're in state 1 or, or state A, state B, state C. And then tau is the transition matrix. And if you write this out in linear algebraic notation, it turns out that you end up getting, um, getting a, uh, a likelihood uh, of observing the entire sequence. If you write this out for all of the values from x1 to x sub t, where t is the number of values, okay? So this is the likelihood. The likelihood a given model, which posits some particular distributions here and some particular um, probabilities of transitioning between states. If that's your model, what's the likelihood you will have observed a given sequence of data, x1 through xt? That's what this gives you. Now, you may ask, well, okay, so what? So it gives me the likelihood of observance. Why do I care about that likelihood? Why do I care as to whether my model says this observed sequence is very likely or not likely at all? And the answer is because it helps us more judiciously choose a model. And the idea is we're going to be finding a model that maximizes this likelihood. We're going to be inferring to try to locate a model that best explains this data, that best accounts for it, that best can produce it. And so we are going to, rather than just saying, this is the model, take it or leave it, we're going to be finding a model through optimization that changes our assumptions, it changes this matrix here and it will often change some aspects of this distribution to find an accounting for the patterns that we see that best explain the data in terms of maximum likelihood. So we're going to be changing the assumptions about the transition matrix saying, hmm, how if we, at the first uh, row of the transition matrix, which represents the probabilities if we're in state A that will stay in state uh, A or that will go to state B, how if we were to you know, make this probability of staying in state A higher. Maybe we're to make it 0 0.5, 0 0.5. How would that, how, how likely would that make the observed sequence? So we're taking here as a given the observations from the world, and then we are adjusting our assumptions about the model in terms of the transition probabilities and in terms of these distributions to best match those model those, those uh, uh, probabilities we've observed from the world, okay? So we end up adjusting these. Um, and the forward-backwards algorithm is actually going to do something more sophisticated yet. It's going to compute these probabilities going forward based on where we probably were in previous time steps, taking into account all these observations till now. But it's also going to do something you might consider strange. Well, let's put it this way. Forward, the forward uh, sequence makes sense if all you've observed is to this point and you want to know, am I in an outbreak state now, right? All you've observed is 31 and 16 and you want to know, are we in an outbreak crisis now or not? If all you have is the historical observations till now, if all you have is 31 and 16, that's all you've got, then you can Use this to identify the best model, and using that model, ask what's the most likely 
state that we're in now, or what's the probability we're in an outbreak state now or not. You can do that using just the data to this point. But if you have retrospective data, if you have data over time for different time periods, maybe historic data like Li Xiaoyan is working with uh, for decades uh, on a monthly basis from Saskatchewan, or similar data from Alberta on a weekly basis. Um, in that case, we might want to retrospectively ask what was going on at that time in the past, right? And here, we can make use not only of observations to this point, but observations later. So let's consider, for example, this week where we have 15 cases. Maybe looking at the previous cases, we say the probability we're in an outbreak state is quite low because 10 was the previous value. But look, here's 26, the next value. Maybe this is suggesting that at this time we saw 15, it was just a fluke. We actually were in an outbreak state and it was manifested fully you know, in this 26 measurement. So here we consider what's called the backwards, uh, the backwards probabilities. And so here, these are the betas. So we have the forward probabilities. What's the likelihood I'm in a given state at a given time, considering all the previous data? And then we have the backwards probabilities. What's the probability I'm in a given state, considering all the data that comes later from me? And it turns out, if you want to compute the full probability of being in state J at time t, given all the data before and after, you just multiply these together and you divide by the likelihood of observing um, um, the value x of x of one, okay, and and that's that's equal to uh, to this quantity here, and that will take into account both forward and backward retrospectively. What state was I in in this time or that time, or what's the probability I was in state A versus state B here? What was the probability I was in an outbreak state or non-outbreak state here? What's the probability I was in a non-outbreak or outbreak state there? Does that make sense? Okay. So, so these are the forward, forward backward outcomes. Now, now the, the packages out there are, for example, we'll do these calculations for you. And I've shared with you some HMM code, which, which uses R to perform calculations like this. And it's all you know, a simple call to the forward backward algorithm. Um, and it will compute those probabilities of being in a, sta a given state um, for a given model. And there's also um, algorithms that will allow you to find via maximum likelihood estimation model structure given the data in an unsupervised way. And you could then test that model to a degree against what you would infer based on another subset of the data in a sort of cross-validation way. Okay, for Turby algorithm, one of the most common algorithms for use with hidden Markov models is Viterbi. And Viterbi saw a lot of, when I was in graduate school, um, where this was seeing a great deal of use was speech recognition, where it was used to recognize the single most likely sequence of words that someone said, take into account what they said earlier or later, et cetera. Um, it's, it's another workhorse algorithm of hidden markup models. So what this gives you is quite different from the HMM, um, forward backward algorithm. Uh, so with the forward backward algorithm, what you're gonna get out is the probabilities, either through the forward algorithm, just given all the data till now, or the forward and backward retrospectively, um, the data, the probabilities of being in each state at a given time. So this is gonna allow you to infer at that time, there was an outbreak going on with this probability. At this other time, there's an outbreak going on with that probability. Or going historically, over all data from a three-month Ethica study, um, maybe when were the periods they had the phone on their person, and when were the periods they didn't have the phone on their person? So in other words, when were they not holding the phone, when were they holding the phone? Tina Thomas from my group, Another notable student for the purposes of this boot camp um, has a little algorithm for inferring when the phone state is on. And this would tell you um, 
you know, retrospectively, whether they have their state on or, or their phone, the phone screen on or not, which could allow you to total up the screen time for a given participant. By inferring from the data that comes in, take into account missing data, um, when did, was the screen state on, when was it off. Okay, so um, very useful, uh, but the Viterbi algorithm gives us not probabilities at a given time, what was the probability of being in a screen on or screen off, or what's the probability they're sitting, standing, lying down, um, or active. For Turby algorithm gives you the single most likely sequence of states. So what it's saying is, look, put aside all these probabilities of being in different states at different times. What's the single sequence of particular states that's most likely. So maybe it's sitting, 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 standing, standing, sitting, lying down, lying down, lying down, lying down, sitting, standing, standing. It's a single sequence of states over the entire time. And it says that single sequence is the most likely one. Of all, it's most likely. Sometimes you, you would like this. Sometimes you would like to say, just tell me when there was an outbreak. Tell me for each period of time if there was an outbreak or not. That's all I want, full stop. At other times you want, what's the probability there was an outbreak at this time versus that time versus that time? And you want to deal with the probabilities. Forward backwards algorithm for the probabilities. For Viterbi, the single sequence is most likely. Okay? Um, and uh, it's a sophisticated algorithm. It's based on dynamic programming. Um, uh, I'm not going to, um, to go into that, but it uses the results of the forward-backward algorithm for, for computing the single most likely sequence. Okay? Now, I want to highlight some features of this um, that are, are not going to be obvious from my description. Um, let's go back to this case. So what we're, what we're using here is we are tallying up for every time point we're tallying up what's the probability we're in one state versus the other state. By taking into account the probability we were, were, were in that state when we arrived and times the probability of observing this datum from that state. So that's what this, this sequence is giving us. And the probability we're in the state when we arrived um, into the state uh, before we saw that sequence, the prior probability is, is based on probability we're in different states the past time and the transition matrix entries. That's what that is. So these are the transition matrix entries um, uh, here, right? Um, okay. Um, what, what very useful about hidden Markov models, one of the big reasons we use them, is let's suppose that there was missing data. Let's suppose that we didn't have observations for long periods of time. What do we do then? Right? How do we judge what's going on for the periods of time where it's missing data? And one thing that can be done quite readily is to accommodate within this framework exactly that. You could say, OK, for a missing data item, an item where there's no observation, we'll view it as equally likely to occur in an outbreak state and a no outbreak state. We, we won't use it to, to, to choose either one. So P of A of a missing data and P of B of a missing data will both be be one. In which case, all that will be determining what, you're in, what state you're in now, what the probability of what state you're in will be what state you were in last time in the transition matrix. So the longer it's been since you observed a datum, you'll grow more and more uncertain and more and more your understanding will be dictated by the transition matrix. Because it will it'll be moving towards a situation where it's well mixed and um, you, wherever, if you iterate the transition matrix many, many times, you'll tend to spend maybe 90% of your time in a non-outbreak state, 10% in an outbreak state, and that's what will be dictating uh, the situation. But it will be, you'll be uncertain. 
But then once data starts coming in again, you'll get more and more confident as to your current interpretation of it. So if you have missing data, it's readily accommodated in HMF. And the longer you go without data, the more uncertain the HMM will become about what state you're in, more dictated by, or the more dictated it will be by the uh, transition matrix, is how I should put it, um, by the underlying theory compared to the data. Okay? So hidden Markov models can be actually quite good at dealing with missing data. But you should recognize for many hidden Markov models, what, what assumptions you end up coming to in the absence of data are largely those that are implied by the transition matrix, by the matrix that says, what's our probability going between states? Okay. Um, so uh, a couple further um, uh, comments here. Um, HMMs are not the right tool when there are continuous states. Here we're going to deal with things like uh, filtering techniques, common filtering, or particle filtering, or when there's a highly memoryful states, um, uh, which I shouldn't say they're not the right tool for memoryful states. You have to disaggregate the model in some ways. Um, and I would say they're at the boundary of system science models. They're not nonlinear, and they're not really situational where, where we have the whole grid and the sum of the parts, but they provide some intuitions here. Um, Dynamic models add further power to HMMs by allowing continuous states, continuous time, nonlinearity, and memoryful states in richer contexts. And we're going to be seeing them with particle filtering. So this gives some understanding of HMMs. Um, my temptation now is to talk a little bit about how this was applied for a case study, which would be associated with determining sitting, standing, lying down. Is that okay with people? Would people like to take a break first? Mm -hmm. Okay, hearing, hearing no response. Um, I will assume that the answer is no, and 